This is an introduction to Amy Clampett's sonnet, The Cormorant in Its Element, by Michael Elliott at the University of Calgary. The goal of a literary critic when reading a text is always to make an interpretive argument. And those arguments always depend on turning one's observations into evidence for those arguments. When the text is a really short poem, like this sonnet by Amy Clampett, your observations have to arise from repeated rereadings of the poem. Now, in another video, I've addressed in lots of detail how to turn your ideas into arguments in four discrete steps. The first is how to annotate poems for six things form, structure, mood, sound, language, and comparisons. The second step is how to think about the notes that you've taken. The third is how to filter your thoughts. And finally, the fourth is how to summarize your arguments. If you're interested in those four steps and those multiple ways to annotate poems, I strongly suggest that you go watch that video after this one, but today's video offers a really abbreviated version of that process that focuses only on the sound of Amy Clampett's poem. Why focus only on sound? In short, it's because it's the feature that I happen to notice right after I notice the form of this sonnet when I looked for its rhyme scheme. And it's the feature that I saw as something from which I could make an argument. In other words, when your goal is to write an interpretive argument, you really need to approach your text with an open mind. The text will tell you what it means and how it makes that meaning. And your job as a critic is to notice and describe those things. Okay, I'll do a reading of this sonnet, and then we'll talk about some strategies for interpreting it. Amy Clampett, The Cormorant in Its Element That bony pot-bellied arrow, wing-pumping along implacably, with a ramrod's rigid adherence airborne to the horizontal, discloses talents one would never have guessed at. Plummeting waterward, big black feet splayed for a landing gear, slim head turning and turning, vermilion strapped this way and that. With a lightning glance over the shoulder, the cormorant astoundingly, in one sleek, involuted arabesque, a vertical turn on a dime goes into that inimitable vanishing and emerging from under the briny deep act. Which, unlike the works of Homu Houdini, is performed for reasons having nothing at all to do with ego, guilt, ambition, or even money. There are two strategies that a critic can undertake when analyzing a text and making an argument from it. And each of those strategies has one thing in common, and that is that you have to move very flexibly, very nimbly between reading the text, drafting your ideas about the text and your response to it, and organizing your ideas into arguments. The first strategy that I'll talk about is to draft and then organize your ideas. A first draft is also sometimes called a free write because you are quite literally writing down in any particular order you like the ideas the response that you have to a text, the ideas that it provokes in your head, your response is real time and it is live. And it is not going to be very beautiful or very well organized when you get it down the first time. 
That's why it's really important that after you do your free write, you winnow your words down. You take out certain ideas, sentences, etc. that are not really going anywhere or are just initial impulses or notions that you don't feel like you can fit into a larger structure of interpretation. Here, for example, is a free write that I did based on Clampett's poem, just noticing, starting with the things I noticed and then building on those initial impressions. Right away, I noticed the hyphenations and the way that Clampett breaks words like astoundingly across not just a line, but also a stanza break. Why are there stanzas at all? What they suggest with their four, four, three, three divisions of the 14 line sonnet structure is the Petrarchan octave and sestet with its two quatrains and two tercets. That takes me to rhyme and makes me look for an A, B, B, A structure, which would be typical in the opening quatrain. But there I find only half rhymes only shared letters and sounds among those end words, some of them in jumbled orders. I hear adherence and talents as similar sounds, more obvious when I speak them than when I read them with my eye. Further below, I see why astounding with a hyphen was necessary to rhyme with landing and with plummeting, sort of, and even lightning in line seven's penultimate word. So why did Clampett put lightning there? And are there other words before line endings that have the same sound effects? You get the idea. After a much longer free write like this, and that one was just a paragraph, I would take it apart and do what's called a reverse outline. And that is a process whereby you look at what you've said and you either break it up into its outline sections or you just on a new piece of paper or in a new document, try to simply outline the phases, uh, the stages, the logical flow of, or at least the stages of what you have written so far. The nice thing about a reverse outline is that you can instantly see simply by stepping back from what you've written, how it flows, and more importantly, what parts of it don't flow logically, and or which ones don't, which sections don't really fit into something more cohesive of an argument. Your next step is frankly the most important. You have to murder your darlings. This is uh, an expression or a phrase rather that Stephen King has popularized in his book on writing, but he's actually citing the British academic Arthur Quiller Cooch's book from 1916, The Art of Writing. So after you write your reverse outline and you eliminate the sections, the sentences, the ideas that are your darlings but must be murdered, you then reorder them using the outline in order to figure out how it is that you are going to build your argument logically. So much for the free write strategy, that is to say the one where you draft and then organize. Let's talk now about how you invert that process and organize before you draft. For this, you very much need at least an initial idea of what it is that you are going to say in your argument. You are going to set the milestones or the stages of that argument so that they follow a logical order. And then you're going to reorganize and rethink that order. But as I say, you have to start with the, a, a provisional thesis, at least, which you are going to revise. And again, on this, my earlier video elaborates a great deal. For a provisional thesis, then I would start with this. Clampett writes like the cormorant acts, out of an instinct for diction and syntax, or her choice and arrangement of words. 
Clampett's diction and syntax cause the interconnected sounds and alliterations that govern virtually every word of this poem and make it beautiful. That's very much not a perfect thesis, but it is probably what I would start with in order to analyze its language and start to work out how it was that I was going to order my argument to deal with the different components of that language and the ways that Clampett is using them. Now let's turn to my annotated copy of the poem and you can immediately see why earlier in this video I didn't show it to you because I've written all over it. My process, as I said in my free write, was to start with the initial quatrain looking for an ABBA structure that didn't really exist. And then I noticed that adherence and talents had similar sounds and certain letters in common, the EN structure. Noticing that EN structure was what then led me to noticing the NG structure, sometimes ING and sometimes, in fact, inverted GN. So look at along in line one, plummeting in line four, landing in line five, astounding in line eight, which in turn led me back to line seven with the G and N in inverted order. But the word glance in line seven has a much stronger connection to vermilion and to briny and to, of course, Houdini and then money at the bottom of the poem. There are, of course, other structures that I started to find the repetition of the L sound in along and plummeting and landing and vermilion and vertical and inimitable and all in line 13. But what really convinced me that there was alliteration governing her selection and arrangement of words was the word astounding, appropriately enough, in line 8. And the way that astounding echoes the word lightning in line 7. I'm not going to belabor all the alliterations that I managed to find in this poem. My annotations, which you can see here, might illuminate some of them, but frankly, they are just the ones I happen to notice. But as I found, it's occurred to me that every word in this poem alliterates with at least one or two, perhaps, other words elsewhere. Now, alliteration tends to be in other poems anyway, tends to be quite localized. It's within a couple of words. It's very rarely across lines. But Amy Clampett's alliteration and internal rhymes and repetitions of sounds make you look for it and find it all the way through. It doesn't follow a discernible pattern. It is just pervasive all the way through this poem. And its lack of pattern, at least one that I could find, is what led me to describe it at least provisionally as instinctual in my thesis, as instinctual as the cormorant hunting fish. An act which Clampett's final lines, beginning with the word act in line 12, an act which she contrasts with the lower motives of human actions. An act of hunting that Clampett describes as an involuted arabesque, a spiraling turn, with the other meaning of involuted, which is internally dependent on other components, complicated and entangled in its own structures of repetition and variety.